Bitcoin is really a change and we're at a crossroads. The fiat system, it's corrupted and we're heading towards CBDCs, which is not a good thing at all. They don't understand that freedom comes with responsibility. The first quarter of 2022, we had tens of millions of customer funds lost through our platform because they were scammed and didn't understand how to deal with self-custody. Imagine there were CBDCs during COVID and during the lockdowns. It would have been a perfect tool to actually let people not buy at certain areas, not get into to a restaurant, not do this or that, just by programming it into the money. And that's the danger of CBDCs. We have the possibility to end up in a totalitarian uh, surveillance uh, situation. And on the other hand, we have a huge chance with Bitcoin to change a lot for the better. The next three to five yeah. years will be super yeah. interesting. Imagine if officially nation states get into Bitcoin and start accumulating Bitcoin, we could indeed cease hyper Bitcoinization. There is a lot of companies and whales on institutional money coming in and the retail crowd yeah. is sleeping. The window is closing in terms of uh, getting Bitcoin for a reasonable price. Nostra in 2024 is like Bitcoin in 2012. Don't hide on Nostra. We need people on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube to be active Bitcoin advocates. What did you learn so far from interviewing so many great people in, in Bitcoin? Well, I learned that it's a very strong community, that they um, are in general very, let's say, mainstream critical. They think they that uh, Bitcoin can is really a change and we're at a crossroads, right? Where on one hand, we have the possibility to end up in like a totalitarian uh, surveillance uh, Situa situation and on the other hand we have a huge chance with bitcoin to change a lot for the better stuff that wasn't really fixed for let's say even uh centuries or thousands of years you could even say uh yeah the money issue um that uh, money can be inflated and uh, yeah bitcoin is an answer to that and yeah people on bitcoin conferences uh, yeah they uh They realize that and um, yeah, it's a strong community and um, yeah, especially after uh, COVID, you know, it's a very f refreshing thing to meet these kind of people who are generally critical and then you end up wondering a lot of things actually. <laughs> Uh, so many things uh, from nutrition uh, to yeah realizing that we live in a in an environment where there's a lot of propaganda um to yeah the fiat system of course it's corrupted and and we're heading towards cbdc's um which is not a good thing at all um yeah so yeah i generally ask questions and um You know, I, I like to learn and maybe even teach, like peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer teaching, you could say. Um, and that's what I find interesting. Um, and yeah, those conferences give give that opportunity. You know, I can ask questions. I, I did surveys a lot. So I asked uh, Bitcoin professionals, enthusiasts, industry leaders, certain questions, and I get all the different takes on one question. So that's kind of interesting for me um so yeah that's what i'm doing right now <laughs> I, i love it a lot so, but but you you're doing that full-time now or like you still have a fear job next to it or right now i'm giving myself some time to do that and let's see where that goes um before i was working well let's say in the beginning i don't have an economic background you know i um I used to study music production and composition. Uh, I worked in the media production industry for a while, then in marketing. Um, that's a, it's a while back. Uh, I had no idea about finances. I never saved money. Um, uh, yeah, so that was never an, an, a topic for me. And I remember my stepfather telling me, like, Uh, you have to spend your money. You have to bring your money into circulation. Um, And then it will come back to you, like the law of attraction or law of circulation. And, and that's basically how I lived for a long time. Um, 
earning money and then spending it and then having nothing left. And uh, it took until my mid thirties that I actually had, because of some partnership that I had with some business, I had a little money left over. And it was the first time that I actually had to think, yeah, what shall I do with that money? Um, it's, uh, it's too much to just spend it now. And I w wouldn't know what to spend it on. So it was the first time that I had, had to think about it. And generally I was always a bit mainstream critical and, um, yeah, so, but I, I got into watching YouTube videos and then I started, uh, yeah, getting into precious metals and also crypto uh, currencies. And uh, yeah, I was never into shares that kind of never attracted me because it, it didn't feel like real ownership. And I also was working for a lot of companies in marketing. So I know that companies always portray a very different image often than what actually is happening inside. And so that wasn't really interesting to me. It was precious metal and crypto. And at that time I wasn't really, uh, yeah, Bitcoin maxi. So for me, it was basically the same thing. I did understand self custody is important. And, um, yeah, so that's where I started investing or saving, let's say. And, um, at some point I also said it was like the beginning of the pandemic, like, yeah, why not work in that area? You know, it wasn't really happy with what I'm doing, what I was doing at that, at that time, um, uh, being a consultant in marketing. And I just thought, let's, um, uh, yeah, find a job in, in crypto or Bitcoin. At that time I was, yeah, it was, I knew Bitcoin was important, but I wasn't really making a clear distinction. So I was, I started to look and, uh, didn't really find anything i figured out figured that or realized that uh yeah there is not that many jobs that easily to be found if you're not a programmer um but i then i found a job at bitvana i don't know if you know bitvana and they were situated in berlin and i went into customer service straight into customer service there was a big career change and from there, I went to the fraud squad. I went into compliance from there, I went into marketing. And from there, I went into business development. So I went through uh, several stages in that company and Bitvara well, used to be um, a German rel quite known uh, company that combined self custody wallets of Bitcoin and Ethereum with a um, bank account in one app. And that was basically they were the only ones uh, at that time. They actually went bankrupt after the bear market or during the bear market and then also relaunched again. Um, but yeah, I started, um, yeah, um, working there. And yeah, I, I noticed firsthand what the real problems are of people that get into crypto often for the wrong reasons, you know. And in that respect, uh, yeah, uh, self custody is one of the biggest risks when people get into crypto for the wrong reasons, because they don't understand it, that freedom comes with responsibility, you know? So, um, um, yeah, I worked in the fraud squad, right? Uh, and, uh, if I remember correctly, the first quarter of 2022, we had tens of millions of funds lost from for uh, customer funds lost through our platform because they were scammed and didn't understand how to deal with self custody, you know? So then, uh, it, so wait, they had it in self custody and they lost it because they got, got hacked. Either they uh, didn't take it seriously with the keys, even though we have several, had several warnings, um, they didn't take it seriously and then they lost the keys. And they changed their phone and they had to re-import the wallet and then we couldn't help them anymore. And with, uh, with, um, uh, with fraud, there's a lot of fraud, uh, going on where especially elder people, uh, elderly people get contacted through phone, WhatsApp, uh, chat messages by so-called brokers that tell them, yeah, why don't you invest a little bit, uh, into, um, Bitcoin or crypto, and then they spend a couple of hundred euros and then over. To okay. Is that okay. 
In, in, uh, I, I don't see you. Just change the camera. Just change the camera. One second. One second. Okay. 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 Okay.
at least some people need custody, you know, and, and to double check what's going on. And especially with older people, at some point, we kind of stopped uh, transactions um, for elderly people like 50 plus who opened an account and immediately uh, converted big sums of money into Bitcoin. That was already like a red flag and then then compliance steps in and ask, yeah, what are you doing? I mean, I kind of hated that part, but I also, on the other hand, saw that um, it's sometimes, yeah, helping people. <laughs> but <clears throat> for the rest, it's kind of a bl black box and also like a, a, an excuse to not communicate anything. Yeah, compliance blocked you and compliance didn't communicate internally what's going on. Uh, so nobody knows and it's compliance and compliance always prefers to be compliant instead of logical or reasonable. So, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this brings me to an interesting question. Um, there's a fine line between uh, helping people, having those guardrails up this compliance guardrails and being <laughs> an overlord of controlling those people. Like, the total freedom for the individual also means that they can screw up and there are no guardrails as with Bitcoin. If you transfer your Bitcoin to an Adam X stress, uh, because you got scammed, they're gone. It's not no, no, no longer your Bitcoin and it's your fault. Uh, someone else scammed you, uh, but, uh, you in the end of the day signed the transaction. Uh, so that, that's like a, f a fine line between like, we, we want freedom, uh, but we also want to protect people. I think a better term maybe might be educate people uh, so they can protect themselves. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Where do you draw uh, uh, the, the, this line for yourself? Do, 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 <laughs> I don't know what this has to do with Bitcoin, but it just came up in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I don't like the compliance part because it is in many ways just backward and, and in, intransparent and also illogical. Uh, but I also saw the other side and I kind of understand. And I got many police requests to deal with where they asked for the data of the transaction history. And yeah, I kind of thought, well, I hope you catch them. The chances are slim, but maybe you can. Um, yeah, well, it's all about education, you know. Um, we have to educate people and maybe even have them follow a, a, a short course before opening, at least in an app where you can immediately uh, convert um, money into Bitcoin, where they kind of have to go uh, through a course where they, yeah, where they prove that they at least understand the most basic things. So I think it's all about educa education, teaching people how it works and a lot of people are working hard on doing that. I mean, you do that uh, in your way. Uh, many people do that in their own way. I, I'm trying to do that. And um, yeah, go from Absolutely. there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah. I think we, I think we kind of have to do it and we have to uh, really go out there because you you said in the beginning you were always a little bit critical uh against what was popular like what we call uh the mainstream um where where did it come from do you think like is, is that something that, that was an event or is that always like oh like i was always critical uh, against uh against mainstream being mainstream things because i was <laughs> I, I was not always critical i was like on the other side i was like oh like the, the mainstream and it's like exactly that line of like mainstream thinking and reversed a lot uh, very early on i mean i'm still just 26 so uh everything is early on but uh how was that for you i cannot really tell you where it originally came from but it certainly <laughs> became very uh present with COVID. you know where I realized there's a lot going on that is not okay. And from there you start questioning a lot of things, um, you know, um, and also the Bitcoin community, if you talk with those people, you, know, you can get into all side, kind of uh, side topics, you know, from fiat building, fiat nutrition, um, fiat wars. Um, yeah. You start wondering, I never thought that, but then I started wondering, is it actually, actually a better thing to have the right to own arms? Uh, I always thought that's actually not a good idea. 
is there really a climate crisis? You can get into all kinds of uh, topics. And uh, yeah, I can't really say where it originally came from. I think that's just a little bit my type of character, but it became very <laughs> present once uh, we went through the whole COVID thing. Absolutely, yeah. I think that was a that, that was probably a, a wake up call for 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 a lot of people. Um, one thing that you also mentioned was CBDCs, and it's it's super interesting. Um, it, CBDCs don't come up as much with non german people <laughs> I, I i see I, I feel like cbdc's is uh, a topic that's really present uh, in in the german speaking is community that, yeah. when i speak with uh, when i speak with africans uh it's almost no topic uh with americans it is a topic but they don't fear it because the american politicians are quite against uh cbdc's like they there are a lot of legislations and, and things against that uh with canadians i have it also uh canadians there's also a, a fear of that because of their government yeah. probably uh so um it's it's, it's super interesting why, why is uh, CBDC, cbdc is a, an important uh topic for you i mean obviously it's it's not a good thing uh but it is how much worse is uh, CBDC to the current digital uh, euro that, that that we have, and, and where do you see the danger in there? Because it completely centralizes control, and it's a tool to uh, uh, manipulate our habits. You know, it's programmable money, and you can um, add a, a expiry date to the money. You can confiscate money at, at uh, click of a mouse. You can make it only valid for certain products in certain uh, areas. Um, imagine there were CBDCs during COVID and during the lockdowns. It was a perfect. It would have been a perfect tool to actually, yeah, let people not buy at certain areas, not get into a restaurant, not do this or that, um, just by. Um, programming it into the money and that's the danger of cbdc's <laughs> and we have enough um statements from like uh, people in that area that it's at the end of the day also the, the what they want you know more control um, um so yeah and then you have bitcoin um so we're certainly at the crossroads at the moment and um yeah i hope uh, enough people wake up early enough so, so yeah, so it's either either the Bitcoin crossroad, uh, like the cross, crossroads between either Bitcoin or or CBDCs. Yeah, I mean, if there was no Bitcoin, that would be pretty uh, not so good, <laughs> right? I mean, so Bitcoin is hope for me as well. You know, if there was no Bitcoin, so being in Bitcoin and and uh, doing that whole thing is also not because you. Uh, want gains of it's mainly also because it's also hope you know um to an, an answer to what is otherwise coming to us you know is that for you the more present uh like is that the uh, bigger reasons for you to have the control over your own money and to be uh not able to be controlled in the transactions, censored in the transactions to be able to go out of countries? Or is it the monetary policy part where uh, the currency is not devalued, so your uh, value is actually rising in the purchasing power? Like this, these are the, for me, always the two main parts of, of, of Bitcoin. What is what is stronger for you? Yeah, I think it's, it's similar because uh, it's, of course, being in control of your uh, purchasing power, of your wealth, of your time working time that you preserved in money uh, and inflation is of course also a way of losing that control of, or losing the purchasing power so it's kind of for me similar so yeah I don't want to lose my purchasing power because that also means I'm not <laughs> really in control of my funds either you know so yeah I don't like either you know <laughs> not being in you, you need kind of both to Sorry? make it sense you you kind of need both to to make sense like i think you cannot have one and the other yeah. <laughs> like if you have con full control of uh, how you can transact it only then you can also have full control of yeah. of it because so otherwise someone can control it 
Yeah, I mean, if you if you uh, have full control about uh, spending hyperinflating uh, currencies wherever you want, that's also not really full control, right? <laughs> I, it, someone still controls uh, the the monetary supply, but I think you you I think you cannot have it uh, only one layer. Like if someone can uh, stop your transaction, probably someone can also manipulate the money supply of a currency. If if, if that that kind of power is is kind of built in, it's either like both ways or, or no ways. Uh, I, I no. feel like uh, because with every currency, uh, the, it is like that. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. You, I also saw you were in the German parliament and I never spoke about that on the podcast. And I thought like, uh, I, I should definitely do that because like right now in the, in the Bitcoin community, when you talk about Germany, everyone uh, has this 50,000 Bitcoin that they sold uh, in the mine. Like that, that's the only thing we know now for, from Germany in the, in the national community. Um, and I think it's a major mistake from them, uh, but still uh, they kind of were forced to, and there were a lot of things involved with, with uh, even being able to do that. Uh, what's going on, would you say, in the German politics with Bitcoin and what insights did you gain from, from the German parliament and being invisible there? <laughs> Yeah, in general, I mean, a lot of Bitcoin want nothing to do with uh, uh, politics. It's like Bitcoin in itself is like apolitical. It's neutral. And uh, since governments are resistant to reform and kind of corrupt, uh, yeah, a lot of Bitcoiners are not into that. But uh, yeah, I've seen, I've been to several Bitcoin in Bundestag uh, events and I've just seen that... <laughs> we have some allies in politics and they're real Bitcoiners and they really want to bring change and, and they're really asking and getting active. And I think we need to get active and we also see results, right? In general, in globally, I mean, it's a, first of all, it's a topic in the presidential race in the U S um, which is a huge thing. I didn't expect this to go so quickly um it's a topic as a strategic reserve i mean that's not really the case in germany yet so i'm don't have a lot of hope that uh germany is gonna catch up in that way but once uh the us does their first move um germany could follow suit and yeah so it's interesting because they made several um, events where they had Roman Rea, which you, I guess, know, um, made presentation. He was also on the podcast uh, uh, already on, on this podcast. So like if, if people want to check it out, it was a really yeah. interesting, very inspirational also with his story, uh, with his illness. Also, it was a, a yeah. great one what he shared there. Uh, Roman Rea just uh, searching in, in the thing. But yeah, so yeah, go on. Absolutely. And... It was just interesting because everything is about privacy in these events, right? So there are people that are interested. So either the members of parliament sent their employees to have a look and check it out because Joanna Kotar, who's the initiator, sends out emails to all the MPs. And then either some MPs come by themselves uh, or they send their employees to have a look. So there's some interest, absolutely. And uh, most uh, events were quite uh, well attended. But they don't really want to be associated with uh, Bitcoin in many cases. So I had some interviews there and I always had to take care that I don't film anyone who doesn't give like uh, consent. Um, so that was interesting. There's stuff going on at, at the... Um, latest or the potentially last event i talked to sam Mao, who is like the nation state bit orange pillar right he was there for the last event and i asked him if there's like stuff going on undercover like um, uh, politicians actually being in favor of bitcoin but not daring to speak out because of all this privacy and yeah probably there are quite some bit uh politicians that are invested uh but I also realized that the whole party system doesn't really allow politicians to speak their mind, right? You speak according to the uh, party uh, book or 
because if you speak your mind, if you, you act according to your conscience, that's not really a good uh, a recipe to get um, uh, into a better position or keep your position in politics. So that's kind of, yeah, I mean, is that how it works? <laughs> that's a bit uh, disappointing, but that's apparently how it works. So yeah, undercover there or, well, there's interest and they certainly, um, they even uh, had uh, courses where they um, explained how you set up a wallet, uh, how what self-custody is. So there's interest and, um, yeah, but we will still have to see with regards to Germany how well that is being uh, put into practice and what the real effects are. And I guess it still depends a lot on what's going on in other places in the world, especially in the U.S. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code ROBIN at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss ROBIN to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. Do, do you think it will change? Like US is a, is, is a major one because uh, even Kamala Harris yeah. came out and, and said positive things about it. Like she, she is not publicly uh, with her words against uh, uh, Bitcoin or uh, at war with Bitcoin, you might make an argument that she has been hostile with her actions. Uh, I don't know about uh, uh, US politics too much, uh, but I have never heard I think she never, <laughs> I actually never heard her say Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, it's it's fascinating that Trump is so vocal yeah. about it. And he even made a tweet today about uh, the white paper day, because today this podcast will be out two weeks later than that, but we are recording on the 31st, so the white paper uh, day in Bitcoin. So that's uh, super interesting that he acknowledges that day. And uh, he, I don't know, he, he said something, uh, I will fight for your rights and then it will stop the war against Bitcoin from, from Kamala. And she he only used a crypto in that tweet like one time and Bitcoin oh, okay. like four times so he yeah. gets better <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah that was a little different before and he launched also his own uh, shit coin let's say <laughs> in the meantime. yeah he, he, this but, world liberty yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but he's not against Bitcoin and that's good and I don't know why Kamala had this sudden u-turn but uh, well that's in general great news I'm uh very excited and interested to see how that turns out, you know. In an, in America, the voter block of Bitcoiners is just too big. 
Like you in, in America, they, they have this president system where like the winner takes it all kind of, uh, and, uh, you kind of need like 70 to 80 million, uh, votes to, to win, uh, like it also, you need it in the right swing states and everything like that. Uh, not getting into that in detail, but um, that, that's uh, really interesting when you look at how many Bitcoiners are there in, in America and then uh, how many voters do you need? And that uh, amount is, is pretty similar. Like you, you have like 50 to 100 million Bitcoiners or have like Bitcoin on their asset in some sort so like 50 million is um, the most gases like some say go a little higher i always try to stay conservative and say 50 million people in america have bitcoin exposure in some sense and if you see that and you need like 70 million to 80 million to win a vote that's that's a major block of voters uh for for someone to gain and that's why trump is speaking about it if there would be like five million bitcoiners he would not be that vocal about it he would not take his time out and go to a bitcoin conference that's where we were four years and eight years ago where he did not show up and he was even hostile yeah. a little bit with his words against bitcoin yeah. i mean uh, i didn't know that there were so many bitcoiners in in the us but that's basically also what joanna kotar says in germany people tend to not open their mouth as much and she said you have to talk to your local politicians that bitcoin is a topic for you if you want to have them change your politics and um yeah that's what she's working on i'm not sure uh, german um culture let's say is a little bit different um but yeah it it uh, politicians want to get reelected right so if they realize that it's a big topic, they might do something. Yeah. Absolutely. And and that's what, what is so interesting about the time. So if, I feel like it's a really great time yeah. uh, to be alive right now. Next three to five yeah. years will be super yeah. interesting in I Bitcoin. Agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very uh, curious. <laughs> I have no clue what's going on, but that's why I'll ask all my guests, oh, what do you expect for the next years? <laughs> do, you, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> well, with regards to Bitcoin adoption, I thought it was expected to go slower than it's actually going. But with regards to the Bitcoin price, I actually expect expected it to go faster. So I, I've seen much more adoption and promising news than uh, what I expected, but I thought the price would be much higher. Um, well, in general, I, I'm very bullish and, um, yeah, very bullish. Uh, I cannot really put a number on it. Um, um, but I'm, I kind of imagine if really <clears throat> officially nation states get into Bitcoin and start accumulating Bitcoin, we could indeed see some sort of hyper Bitcoinization, right? Because if the race is on and everyone joins in, then there is a real hard cap, a fixed supply, and that will get into effect at some point. And then on the other hand, we have basically even central banks who could print out of, uh, could print money out of thin air to get more Bitcoin. It, it, it could get crazy, but let's see. <laughs> I want to share something with, yeah. with you really quickly. Uh, that is super interesting for me always to look in because even though um, AI is getting more and more popular and I personally use Google <laughs> less and less actually, uh, so maybe this those charts will be outdated at some point because yeah. nobody uses Google anymore yeah. for searching. But I think right now they still have a lot of uh, interesting, like they, they, they had a lot of legitimacy uh, around uh, how well something how interesting something yep. is right now for the retail yep. crowd not so interesting so well, it's, it's 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 at the start so right it's super yep. low like if, if you see we were basically here in 2021 at the height um we have a, a higher high we had here uh, with the bitcoin price especially if you account for more bitcoins or the market capitalization uh, was big, bigger actually because there are more bitcoin uh plus the price so 
there's a lot of, I think, companies and whales on institutional money coming in, I think. Uh, and the retail crowd yeah. is sleeping. Like nobody's talking about Bitcoin. Nobody is interested in Bitcoin. Seems like we are still in a bear yeah. market <laughs> when you look at yeah. those charts. I mean, I, I've, I've yeah. written an article on my blog. I think it was the first about Bitcoin in beginning of 2021, which I titled uh, Jump on the Bandwagon Before the Whales Do. And hoping that's would be what would be my hope that uh, retail and normal people jump in first and then uh yeah the big players come in after but that's kind of over now i mean uh, now the big players come in they're they're already in and uh well the message is still the same <laughs> uh join us uh but uh yeah so the whales are definitely in the game now and um the window is closing <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, getting Bitcoin for a reasonable, reasonable uh, price. Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, the most amazing thing for me is the corporate, uh, the company adoption of Bitcoin. That, mm -hmm. that seems to be... Yep. Uh, just just going straight up with how many companies will, 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 will do that. Did you hear about yeah, Microsoft? I heard that, yeah. Man, uh, how, how likely do you think it, it is that Microsoft actually uh, buys Bitcoin? I think it's quite likely. I'm, I'm not, I don't really understand how this voting system internally works, but it's apparently the employers that decide if they should invest in Bitcoin or not, right? And they have a lot of... Uh, the, the, sh the shareholders. Shareholders, shareholders. Yeah. shareholders. And they have a lot of... Employees would be an uh, interesting yeah, yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's likely and if they don't do it it will be someone else i mean you heard about michael saylor right he's trying to what was that 40 42 yeah. billion that's uh crazy <laughs> I, I i i was seeing that and i was like did they mess something up with the number yeah, there? yeah exactly yeah <laughs> Uh, really, really cool. Uh, m massive. Yeah. I think there's a lot of adoption coming along. There's a lot of things happening and you had a lot of Bitcoin, uh, conferences also. I liked it a lot. What is your one next conference that you're looking at? Is, is there some, some plan already in? Well, I'm definitely going regularly to the Bitcoin meetups. Um, yeah, I'll, I just checked. So there's a lot actually going on in, in South America, which I'm probably, I'm unfortunately not able to attend. I don't actually know yet. I will definitely go to BTC Prague, but that's still one year ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm still researching, but, uh, the, the, I will have to miss a couple of, uh, couple of conferences this year. It's interesting when, when you think about this whole game theory thing, because it might be that, uh, the countries that are now looking really good and people want to go there and they have a really big uh, pull factor might be not the countries that have a big pull factor in like 50 years because they are kind of convenient in their place and they're like, ah, we don't want that. We don't want that. that. And in the meantime, Nigeria, Africa, El Salvador, uh, A Argentina, all those countries are really like having a grassroots movement of Bitcoin and they're adopting yeah. it. And meanwhile, in Germany, meanwhile, in Austria, we're like, yeah, I don't know. It's a luxury thing. We don't need it. It's volatile. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, what I kind of expect too. I mean, there needs to be more pain and there's not enough pain here apparently yet to really adopt changes. Um, so yeah, we, we, <laughs> I don't think the biggest adoption is going to happen here, but well, let's see, let's see. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it will be interesting, uh, to, to find out what's your, what's your, I think we also talked about uh, the future, um, adoption, what do you expect on the think Microsoft? We also talked about a little bit now it slowly comes back to our conversation. Uh, what do you expect over the, the, the next couple of years? Yeah, that's what I try to uh, say. I mean, I, I, I don't think, well, I expected the adoption to be slower, but I, I expected the the impact on the price to be more drastic. So I was really wondering, I, we had such uh, major changes and uh, like the, the spot ETFs and so forth that I thought uh, it would um, show in the price more clearly. So 
in general, I'm very bullish. Um, I'm very hopeful. Um, I also think that's our shot, you know, to change stuff. Also with Noster, you know, uh, I'm starting to get more and more into Noster. That's How do you like, like it? Is, is, it? is it good for you? Yeah, that's like the social, the Bitcoin of social media, right? And I have, I've did this, I did the survey in, in Amsterdam where I asked uh, people, um, Noster in 2024 is like Bitcoin in 2012. I think I asked you the same question. And then are you on Noster yet? And like everyone knew Noster. And I think most people were on Noster with the exception of one or two people. But yeah, the UX is really not good. Uh, it's it could, There's a lot of improvement that has to be done. But yeah, that's probably was the case or it certainly was the case with Bitcoin back then as well. So um, many people are like, well, if I would have had the opportunity to get into Bitcoin earlier, uh, then they would have done that, of course. And me, myself, also, I knew about Bitcoin right from the beginning, I think 2010, but I it took me nine years, like 2019, to actually really do something. And But now we have Noster and we, we have the chance, especially if you're into uh, freedom of speech, if you want to, um, yeah, if you're... It, it'll, I'm, I'm sure it'll play a big role. And now you have the ch chance uh, to be a first mover, right? And have a first mover advantage. Um, so, yeah, I want to get into that. Um, I'm, I'm meeting, I'm going to the Noster meetups, the second one, the first one that were in Berlin, were maybe f five, six people. And the second one, a month later, the, the room was already so full, there were maybe 30 plus people. And some people had to look uh watch from outside uh, because yeah it was much better attended than the first time um and especially with current developments you know all the censorship and and and, and chat control um i think um yeah we should all i hope to i hope for us all to connect connect on nostra at some point even though it's it's it doesn't have the best uh, user experience at at the moment yeah it's the the one thing that is is different it doesn't have a clear financial incentive days of course uh if if nostra becomes the main protocol uh, and you're building now an audience there, you might be financially re rewarded down the line if a lot of people come there and then uh, pay you a lot for, for making posts, but you still have to like make posts uh, for for that. Uh, th that's the one thing where I'm like, that's, that's different. And I'm, I'm really looking forward how how this pans out because a Bitcoin is was for a long time, and for some, it still is a pain to uh, adopt and and figure out how to do it with keys and how to do it with self custody. But there's such a big financial incentive there <laughs> because it's such a great asset that uh, pushes up your purchasing power. With uh, Nostra, most people are like, ah, I already like only a handful of people actually experiences uh those freedom of speech big issues like most people just like oh they have like on instagram stories a few stories about their lives they they, they don't really care if if instagram is is uh pushing topics down so what i think maybe if we have big big freedom of speech instances where they are actually banning a lot uh that might help that whole thing but then we have x and Elon musk that is pushing that narrative uh, and he's already uh forcing youtube <laughs> and forcing other platforms to be more freedom of speech loving because now youtube and google and facebook you know like oh shit that there, there is x and people go there uh if we do weird stuff on youtube and, and facebook so i'm really like that nostra is something extremely fascinating to to watch and i myself uh, am now since this year in on nostra i tried it one year before that and one year before that i opened it I used it and I was like, that's so bad. <laughs> no, no normie will ever do that. It's such a bad experience and there's no financial incentive. Now, the but, but what do you mean by financial? Sorry, sorry. What, what do you mean by financial incentive? 
<laughs> the financial incentive. So if you bought Bitcoin at 2010 mm. and you just hold it, you are hilariously rich now. If you open now a Nostra account and don't do anything with that, <laughs> you're not hilariously rich in 10 years. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct, yeah. But uh, what I find fa fascinating is that uh, you can get zapped. I mean, the first zap, which I just recently got, was like an amazing uh, experience for me. And, and you know, in on other platforms, you, um, you have marketing companies um, putting ads, and there will probably also be ads on Noster, but it, it's basically running... You can get compensated without any ads, right? So you, they're zapping each other for interesting content, and the whole, yeah, ad structure that you see on YouTube or on X is, is not really there, and maybe not even necessary in that sense. So that's kind of interesting, I think. And it's true, uh, X is probably the most free, freedom of speech platform. But I mean, most of the the thought exchange nowadays happens online and in most cases on the platform of private companies so that's actually also kind of weird right to because at the end of the day they control the algorithm i think we should even have we should even be able to make our own algorithm because if i have if i subscribe to over the years to a thousand youtube channels or to a thousand people on twitter it's still the platform that decides what I get to see. And I'm actually, I want to be able to control that, you know, because then they're still kind of, yeah, deciding what's important to see or not for me. And I I'd prefer that to be completely uh, transparent. So I built my own algorithm uh, to get the message that I want to see. And maybe that's going to be possible on Nostra at some point. And, the idea that you have a private key and, and you lock into something and um, own your identity, own your thoughts, own your speech is kind of very interesting and also very uh, relevant, I think, nowadays, because we've seen it uh, on YouTube. I love YouTube, you know, I love Twitter, I love YouTube, but uh, there's been so much uh, censorship and just channels being um, deleted uh, for, yeah, no reasonable reason i think in many cases that uh, yeah i think nostra could be an answer but of course a lot has to happen still um yeah but i'm trying to become more active um when i post i often think and i also start doing it that i post first on nostra and then afterwards post it on twitter maybe and uh, but give nostra the priority but uh Absolutely. A lot has to be done also like with private keys, right? You, 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 at some point, if you get a really uh, like an influencer account, it's, it's, it's your identity that could be stolen, right? And you don't um, really have uh, the security with, with Bitcoin wallets, right? That you can sign into your profile uh, while not revealing your keys to an, 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 an on a laptop that is connected to the internet, you know? Um, so yeah, let's see how that plays out. I, I would love to see it. I see a lot of challenges uh, along the way, but I would love to see NOSA being the protocol and then you can just use whatever client you want to use. I had an amazing, oh my God, moment with Nostra. Once I plugged in my uh, fountain to Nostra. Because all of a sudden now, if I'm on Fountain and replying to people's activity on the Fountain app, it shows up on my Primal app. Mm -hmm. And this is like, oh, like, that's fascinating. It's like you, I reply to someone on YouTube and it shows up on X, like that kind of moment. Yeah. And if we get to a point where the Nostra uh, network effect is so strong that Twitter, YouTube, Facebook have to adopt it. 
like I think they will not vanish. They, they if 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 Nasser gets so strong, they they will uh, adopt it. Or if they don't adopt it and Nasser gets so strong, they will die. <laughs> uh, but if they're clever, they will just adopt it um, and figure out advertising models on Nostra because it's still possible. And I think even the, the people actually are working on on that right now. Uh, so it's it's super interesting to see. Um, the only thing that I'm always urging people to do not don't hide on Nostra. <laughs> like like we need people uh on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube to be active Bitcoin advocates. If you're active and Bitcoin advocate, don't just like, oh like let's put everything on Nostra and don't interact with the normies. Like yeah. <laughs> like we 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 need the digital soldiers where the the normies are and not where only Bitcoiners are. It's great that we have that space uh, but we should not hide in an echo chamber uh, we should go out there and and actually discuss with people uh, why bitcoin uh, i don't have any fear that this happens i just want to put a message out there <laughs> that people should not hide uh, f- from the normies uh, because uh, uh, the nostra gives now an exit <laughs> yeah i agree i mean um i I started to like put at the end of some messages that um, I still like to connect on Nostr. So pull them in from all the other platforms into Nostr. That would be great. But yeah, but I also see other people who actually did only go to Nostr and they also have success with that strategy. You know, Um, they, they have a big following there and yeah, I mean, if they want to do it that way, that's fine with me too, but I'm on your side. Uh, we, we still have to be on the other platforms and um, get in touch with the normies. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Very, very true. Perfect. Then let's come to uh, closer to the end routine of, of, of the podcast. Um, one question that I always ask my guest is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? From me? Yes. Like whatever you want to share, uh, a skill, uh, a hobby, uh, uh, and, 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 and insight, uh, learning, whatever you want to, to have, like what you want to share with the audience besides Bitcoin things. <laughs> mm, interesting. I wasn't prepared for that. Um, that's the one question that most, uh, guests are like, Oh, let me think <laughs> it's <laughs> super interesting. You have like, a, a one hour conversation, like it's, it flows extremely nicely. Uh, and, uh, and the guest is like giving answers, answers, answers. And then it's like, Oh wait, outside of Bitcoin, I don't do anything, outside of Bitcoin. but I, I really want to get this, uh, th- this part in, in the podcast because of two reasons. First of all, I want to get my guests better than, uh, get to know my best guests better. And second, I think Bitcoin will at some point be extremely boring. Uh, so we Bitcoiners should, uh, we shouldn't make our whole identity around Bitcoin because at some point it's like making your whole identity around the TCP IP protocol. Like <laughs> that's not sexy. <laughs> True. I mean, um, yeah, I do have other hobbies and when Bitcoin is a rabbit hole, a deep rabbit hole, you could go into, you could also, uh, go into the jujitsu rabbit hole. You know, I, I do MMA and jujitsu and, um, <clears throat> there was this, um, MMA fighter, Renato Moicano. I don't know if you, have you ever seen his speech after a fight where he's last time he said, uh, fuck Marcon and uh, this and that. And then please read that book about Austrian economics from Hans Hermann Hoppe. And, um, I actually, uh, was trying to interview him. Not sure if that will still be possible, but yeah, that's also, yeah, I'm not sure if in what ways you can connect them to each other, but I do jujitsu and uh, I could teach people about it. And, uh, that's also a very interesting rabbit hole. Um, to go down and yeah, that's mm, something from me that maybe some people can learn something about. And uh, in general, I think um, it's always about staying critical, questioning things in general, um, but be flexible in your mind, but also persistent in your, in your conviction and 
and uh, don't get crazy during these crazy times uh, because there is light at the end of the tunnel and um, um, a lot of good things can happen. Amazing. Uh, I, I love that a lot. Really cool. Um, let's come to, to the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, oh. without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, your question from the previous guest is a two-parted question. I uh -huh. think the first uh, <laughs> answer I already, already know. Have you lowered your time preference since you adopted Bitcoin? Yeah. The second question <laughs> uh, is, uh, what impact uh, did it have that you lowered your time preference on on your life? Yeah, well, you look, uh, you live more minimalistic. Um, you make more thorough decisions about what you really need to buy and what you don't need to buy. Um, and that uh, Bitcoin taught me that. Um, Maybe it's also my age, maybe also together with my experience. But uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a uh, hodler, and um, yeah, Bitcoin taught me that. So yes, mm, super interesting, super interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for for being on the show. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions, and and read more about you? Uh, well, they can find me on Twitter. Um, they can find my YouTube channel. I'm not sure if you could put a link in the description. And um, yeah, also, I would love to welcome people on Nostr. So <laughs> I, I, I will put uh, put that in the description and put a link there so you, people can find you there. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, Daniel. And also thank you so much for everyone that is joining us today uh, for, for watching and listening. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow, as always, with another episode. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.